Welcome to today's program, Together in Innovation, Mentoring the Innovators of Tomorrow. My name is Deepak Desharia, Innovation Outreach Program Specialist here in the Office of Innovation Outreach at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. I'll be your MC and moderator extraordinaire for today's program. Before we get into the program, just remember, if you are happen to get disconnected for whatever reason, just click on the link we provided and you'll get back into the program immediately. For those of you who have registered online, this program is being recorded. And when those recordings are available, you will get an email from us uh, letting you know the location and when they have been posted. And finally, when the program concludes, we will send you a brief link for a survey to take. We appreciate your feedback on any of the programs that we do and topics that may be of interest. So it helps us really create better future programs uh, in our office. And so now I would like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Maiwa Awe, INSTEM Director at the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation. She could not be here in person, but she had graciously recorded these comments. Take it away, Dr. Awe. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Maiwa Awe, Director of INSTEM at the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation. It is my pleasure to provide opening remarks today on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, mentoring. As someone who has benefited from exceptional mentors, as a mentor myself, and as someone devoted to helping students develop effective mentoring relationships, I can testify that the impact of mentoring cannot be underestimated. Mentors play a unique role in the professional development of future talent, a role which is different from that of a parent, a teacher, or a friend. Mentors can motivate, challenge, inspire, advocate for, and connect students with various opportunities, while also providing them with the support needed to be successful in their academic and professional endeavors. Today, I want to emphasize just three ways that mentors can be influential. First, research shows that mentoring increases persistence in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and it aids in broadening participation in STEM. Now, I, for one, know that I would not have obtained my PhD in mathematics if it wasn't for mentors who were not just rooting for me by word of mouth, but who had an active role in helping me achieve my goals. Second, mentors can help instill a sense of belonging in their mentees. There is just something very powerful about having a mentor who looks like you or has gone through a similar experience. This can help give mentees that confidence that they belong in and can thrive in a particular setting. And lastly, through my experience in the INSTEM program, students emphasize time and time again that they value the ability of mentors to expose them to various, sometimes non-traditional career pathways and ways of thinking. Frankly speaking, mentoring can spark innovation. Now, if you're interested in being this transformative agent in the life of future generations of scientists, innovators, and scholars, I urge you to become a mentor. If we're attentive to our spheres of influence, we'll find that there are formal and informal opportunities to support our peers or those coming behind us. I wanna thank the Office of Innovation and Outreach
for the invitation to give today's opening remarks. And I look forward to an insightful fireside chat with Kate McCreary and David Price. Now I would like to invite our special guests for today to turn on their cameras. Welcome. Hello there. Thank you for joining us today. And audience, I would like to welcome Kate McCreary, CEO and founder of Rhinebeck Ventures, and David Price, the CEO and creator of The Safety Pouch. Thank you guys for joining me today. Uh, thank you for having thank us. You, hey, this is going to be a great conversation, and uh, I'm excited even before uh, just reading about this story and about mentorship was near and dear to my heart. Uh, so I'm just going to open it up and we'll start with Kate. Just give the audience a brief introduction and a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. So I have been in impact entrepreneurship for almost the last decade. I started with an organization in New York called Echoing Green, which focuses on social entrepreneurship, and then went to uh, an organization called Village Capital. So that's how I got into the venture capital fund side as well as the accelerator side. And, you know, for me, um, or for really for the industry, everything was just sort of starting up. Um, it, impact investing, as it's become known now, was really viewed as very uh, as a very nascent industry, and it was viewed with a lot of skepticism that you could combine impact with profit. And so, for me, um, you know. Uh, entrepreneurs like David uh, really prove out that concept. Um, but uh, to go back to my story, I went home to New Orleans for a few years, uh, running a center for entrepreneurship at Loyola University, New Orleans, which is how I met David. And then most recently, I've been creating and running programs for uh, women entrepreneurs, uh, for Black women and Latina startup uh, founders, and uh, you know, just really helping. Um, those founders to get off the ground to to scale their businesses and to get connected with resources and people. Oh, thank you, Kate. David? Yeah, so uh, my name is David Price and I'm the CEO and founder of The Safety Pouch. Uh, I'm a, I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, where I'm currently a senior at, uh, at Loyola University of New Orleans, where I first crossed paths with Kate, where she was my professor in a business seminar course. Thank you. So let's get, let's talk a little bit about the product, David. <laughs> Tell us about your product, the safety pouch. What is it? How did you come up with this idea? Yeah. So essentially what the safety pouch is, is a removable document holder that allows drivers to store and present necessary vehicle credentials needed for traffic stops um, to prevent active reaching. As I'm sure we all know the horror stories and the tragic outcomes that have happened during uh, traffic stops with uh, drivers being shot and killed by law enforcement. Um, sometimes it was unjustly. So our goal here is to prevent active reaching by allowing drivers to preload all their information inside the safety pouch that can then be stored on their sun visor for easy access. And in the event of a traffic stop, all they would simply have to do is remove the pouch off their visor, roll down their window halfway, and place the pouch on the window. That way, when the officer does approach, all their information is readily available. They have no need to actively reach. And at the end of the day, it's just creating a safer and more efficient experience for the drivers as well as the law enforcement. Um, and just kind of how I came up with the idea for the safety pouch was when I was 16 years old, I had just started driving. And before my parents actually gave me the keys to my car, they sat me down and they had the talk with me. And for those who aren't familiar with what the talk is, it's just a conversation explaining the do's and don'ts of traffic stops and just interacting with police in general. And during our conversation with my parents, um, you know, they just kept really honing in on the fact of do not reach out of sight of the officer, uh, do not reach fast, make sure they know exactly what you're reaching for if you do have to reach and where you're reaching. And they just kept going over and over on that point. And at that moment, I was just kind of thinking, you know, there must be a product out there to help facilitate these interactions between drivers and law enforcement to prevent active reaching, but also just make each party feel a bit bit safer. And I did some research and I couldn't really find any products out there that would do that. 
Um, so in my mind, that's when I kind of first conceptualized the idea of the safety pouch. But at the time, I didn't act on it because it was just an idea and I was just 16. Um, it wasn't until I got to Loyola um, in my freshman year where I was enrolled in Kate's uh, business seminar course. And we had to come up with a, uh, well, for our midterm project, we had to come up with a product or service that would bring a societal change we wanted to see. And that's when I remembered my concept of the safety pouch. So I decided to work on that. And at the end of the course, Kate loved the idea and really helped motivate me to bring the product to market. Wow, that's amazing. And Kate, can you explain a little bit about the class project? And you know, what did you like about David's idea? And how did you guys form this initial mentorship? And did you think David would come through with this? Was he your top student? <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's uh, it's a great question, you know, because uh, as a as a professor, even as anyone who works with founders, um, you know, uh, especially when it is a in in a course, an academic course, um, you know, you you never know uh, what's going to come through, and so uh, to go a little bit into the project, so I uh, as the director of the Center for Entrepreneurship, as I mentioned before, I had created a uh, the freshman entrepreneurship uh, seminar for Loyola, um, and so I based the entire seminar on doing, um, which is a real core tenet of entrepreneurship. And so all students in the course went through the process of coming up with an idea, a uh, product or service. Um, that they solving a problem that they themselves had uh, faced. And so investors look for that increasingly and it's called founder market fit. And so um, after we went through this process that then turned the focus into creating societal change. And, you know, I was incredibly impressed uh, when, you know, this uh, one of my students um, who was Honestly, definitely on the quieter side uh, in class, and he came up to me um, either at the end of class or um, or during my office hours, and he said, "Hey, professor, I've been thinking about this idea for years." And he explained the idea, um, and I said, um, "You know, it's it's on you to to take this idea and run with it." And and he assured me that he was very committed to the idea, and he did. And so we set up monthly meetings. Um, it's a uh, something that I a, a tool that I use with founders um, of every age, and it's really just saying, um, "Hey, let's meet once a month, um, and wherever you say that you want to be, I'm going to hold you to that." And so I was much more impressed um, that he came through every month, um, scheduled the meeting, came through with it, made progress every month. Um, and that's really the key to, to starting successfully is that you just keep at it and keep making that progress. Wow, that is great. So David, it really kept you on track. Yeah, she definitely did. Like <laughs> you said, in our monthly meetings, we would set our goals and you know, some months we didn't meet that goal, she would definitely hold me accountable. And you just figure out what steps we need to take to get to, you know, to accomplishing those goals and setting the next ones. And quite frankly, without Kate, you know, I wouldn't be here today. The safety pouch wouldn't be here. She played a tremendous role in getting us started. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is a bit. So this is kind of it. So this started in the classroom. Yeah. After your project's over, how did this mentorship continue after the classroom? Again, yeah. So. Um, yeah, uh, from my side, we kept meeting, um, but I, I will definitely turn the story over to David from that. that yeah, point on. you know, we will continue our monthly meetings, but, uh, you know, I think kind of evolved kind of from that, you know, just like at any point through the day, you know, if I kind of just needed advice or I just needed to kind of just rant about something that was going on, you know, I'll either email Kate or call her and just, you know, seeing like if she can give any advice kind of on what to do or just kind of or what not to do. And um, just kind of through that, you know, our mentorship kind of grew, you know, I like to consider us as friends now. So, you know, it's definitely to the point where I was really lucky and I really found someone who's like truly in my corner and able to help, you know, get me to the next level. Oh, that is amazing. So speaking of things to rant about, uh, <laughs> you must have faced some uh, hurdles while you're coming to market, while you were producing logistics or whatnot. 
you know, to our audience or for our audience, what are some of those early challenges that you had uh, mm -hmm. getting your product together and being able to be successful? Yeah, so when we, when I had launched the safety pouch, it was right in the heart of the middle of the pandemic. I was in May of 2020, as well as the uh, Black Lives Matters protests were at an all time high. So we were dealing with not only, you know, a pandemic, but also a social issue that was just taking over the country. And at that moment, I, I figured, you know, it was the perfect time, that unfortunate time to launch a safety pouch. But I saw the people really needed it. And we launched a safety pouch as a pre order because I said, you know, it was a pandemic. So things were tough. We're getting things manufactured and getting shipped over in time. But I knew now was the time to act. So we launched as a pre order and it essentially instantly went viral. And, you know, we made a lot of progress on the social media front. Um, about like two weeks into our launch, we kind of hit a wall. Uh, we started trending on Twitter. And I'm not sure if anyone knows, but when you start trending on Twitter, it's typically not for a good thing. It's usually good or bad or some, maybe somebody died. But um, we started trending on Twitter. And as I'm reading the tweets from people, I just saw people were taking a safety pouch and twisting the messaging behind it and really just really bad stuff about the safety pouch and using it like as an anti-police tool. And at the end of the day, that's not what we as a brand stood for. And I had to kind of take a step back and look at the overall launch of the safety pouch. And I realized, you know, we didn't really create a brand behind the safety pouch. I just kind of launched the product and like let people buy it. And at that moment, I knew I had to make the difficult choice, which was to take the safety pouch off the market and kind of completely like just close up for a month to kind of reevaluate how can we successfully launch this product and ensure that we're putting the right messaging behind it that people can really identify with not only from drivers, in particular black drivers, but also law enforcement, ensuring that this is something that they would deem to be useful as well. And we kind of took a step back, got that messaging ready, and we relaunched in June. And we got really lucky. We were able to get the support of Tina Lawson, which is uh, Beyonce's mom. And she really helped push the safety pouch and the messaging behind us, uh, invited us onto her Instagram Live to further talk about the product and just the branding behind it. Um, and then, you know, just on a logistical front, you know, of course, the pandemic, it put a lot of things on hold. So we had issues with delayment of uh, delivery and stuff like that. But all in all, you know, I'm grateful we kind of came out on the other end to be successful. Yeah, that's I mean, Now you're talking about branding uh, when we talk about intellectual property. So you're saying you got a trademark and a patent. And prior to this, before your first launch, did you have those in place before or did you something that you acquired after your initial launch when you saw that there was misbranding going on? Yeah, so, you know, we're still working on our patent, we're patent pending, but, you know, we started off initially, you know, trying to get that secured. And that's when I started doing research, I started talking to different attorneys, I realized, oh, this does not take, you know, a month or two. This is going to take years. I'm like, I don't have years to wait because the problem exists now and the people need it now. Uh, so we launched, you know, just under the patent pending status as well as the registered trademark. But, um, you know, IP is definitely one of the most important things that you need to have as um, as an entrepreneur, if you're coming up with a physical product or a tech product, um, because you can have a great idea. And if you don't have IP behind your idea, someone else will end up with a great idea. And I don't think anyone wants to have something that they worked really hard and truly believes in stolen from them and let someone else sell or try and profit off of your idea. Um, but also a more important part that a lot of people don't talk about behind IPs, you also need to have uh, capital Ooh. available to actually defend your IP in the event that someone is infringing on it. Um, so just making sure you have all your resources available to protect yourself and your brand at the end of the day. Wow, uh, great advice. Uh, I will have to say, you know, we were looking this up. So you were the first student at Loyola to go to market with a product while you're still in school. So it must have been challenging both going to school full time and starting your own, getting your own business up and running, right? So what tips and resources, you know, can you offer or share with the audience today? You know, it may not be school, but it might be like a full time job or, you know, something that they're doing, but they still are looking for that invention they have, 
how did you, you know, what were the things that really drove you and would be like your best pieces or tools to use for these individuals? Yeah, you know, one thing I would say, it was definitely very challenging. It still is challenging because I'm still in school. I'm in my senior year now. But, you know, one thing I will say, you know, is that it's definitely a process and you have to really kind of look at yourself, kind of take a step back. I like to do my journaling, so I just kind of like to write out things that I hope to get done within the next week. And you really just have to make a schedule for yourself. And that's kind of what I've been able to do. And I've been successful with it, with managing both at the same time, but being able to dedicate majority of my time, of course, to run my business, but also time where I'm able to study for my exams, complete my homework, do projects, stuff like that, but also just bringing that to your professor's attention. Just like, hey, I have this going on. You know, is there a chance, you know, we can possibly work something out as far as like scheduling in the future if something is conflicting? Um, you know, for the most part, most professors are understanding, some aren't. So, you know, it's just really figuring out what works for, works for you. Uh, if somebody asks me right now, oh, do you think I should start like a full-fledged business while I'm in school? I would probably say no, but I would never deter anyone from trying to uh, follow their dreams. So at the end of the day, just find what works for you and just stay on that path. So do we all need to find our own cake? Definitely. I think <laughs> everybody needs a cake in their life, in their corner, definitely. Well, that's, that's good to know. Because, Kate, the next question is, you know, you have a proven track record of helping uh, people get to market and startups. So tell me, why do you mentor? You know, what motivates you to help innovators succeed? Yeah, I so I mentor because selfishly, it's the most rewarding thing um, I could do and, and have done. So in one way or another, I've been in education for about 20 years. My first job was being a, a teenage swim coach. And so for me, um, it also ties into a deeper belief uh, in faith that uh, not in the religious sense per se, but that everybody has a duty to mentor and to give back in some way. Um, you know, especially when when it comes to entrepreneurship. You know, entrepreneurship is so lonely. It, it doesn't happen all the time. Um, so I think the more that everybody can alleviate that loneliness, can help somebody else rise, whether it's through sharing knowledge or resources or um, you know, advice or, or all three, then the more that we can make um, every everybody rise and, and this world be the place that we all want it to be, um, the more better, more prosperous place um, in every sense, personal and professional. So that is what gets me up every morning. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, we definitely need more mentors like you out there. Uh, so we're gonna go back to David. If you had, well, let's just, all right, let me go to this one. Because uh, I always think that, you know, once you get a little taste of success, you want to keep going and move forward, correct? You came to school to study political science, mm -hmm. right? Has this journey altered that path? Yeah, it's actually surprises to some people. I am still a political science major. I did not change uh, my major, but um, I, I cannot remember if I was talking to Kate or another one of my mentors about this. But you know, I was like in the process of thinking, like, should I change my major? You know, I have this business. You know, I think it would be good. You know, if I'm actually majoring in kind of what I'm pursuing now. Um, and one of my mentors had asked. They just said. Do you like political science? Do you enjoy studying? I'm like, yes, it's always been kind of what I wanted to go to school to study for. I always love studying government and just politics in general. Um, and the next question was like, do you think you kind of need it? Um, do you think it will help you right now? I was like, I just kind of feel as if I'm learning everything that I would learn in a classroom in real life right now. The only fortunate thing behind it is you're learning in real life. So the consequences are real life consequences and they tend to be a little expensive. But um, you know, at that moment, I decided, you know, I was going to stick with political science and I'm learning everything I could learn in a business class right now by just act actually doing it. Um, so I am still a political science major. Wow, that's that amazing. I, 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 I kind of want to share um, a little, well, Dave, I'm going to ask you to share, you know, it wasn't all peaches and cream for David when he uh, started selling this. Uh, if you could share 
you know, the story and talking about overcoming, you know, an obstacle, mm -hmm. uh, even after he got his first order, uh, I thought it was amazing showing your resilience you have to, and the determination you had to, you know, make sure you follow through on, you mm -hmm. know, your order and you did whatever it took. And I, I mean, I'm thinking about the qualities of, you know, young innovators like yourself uh, and having great mentors like Kate who can kind of lead and guide you, but you still got to do the work, right? You got to follow through. Uh, if you don't mind, could you share with the audience kind of like that, that whole beginning was like, whoa, like it just blew my mind when you told me, and I'd like you to share that with the audience if you could. Yeah. Yeah, so we've recently launched into Walmart stores nationwide. And, you know, to some, you think kind of just the hard part is actually getting the meeting with Walmart and getting them to say yes, but that was by far the easiest part. Uh, you know, quick backtrack, you know, prior to our meeting with Walmart and we got everything scheduled, it was the day after uh, Hurricane Ida hit here in New Orleans. And we here in New Orleans, we had lost power, we lost internet. Uh, the water pressure was super low. So a lot of things were going on and it looked like I was not going to be able to make it to my meeting with Walmart. And uh, I had no means of communicating with them, let them know like what was going on and why I wouldn't be able to make it. But somehow by the grace of God or something out there, I was able to get an internet connection about like five minutes before the meeting. So I was able to create a hotspot to her and join the meeting where I had a bunch of flashlights on my face and a bunch of noise from the generator in the background. But Walmart was very understanding of the situation I was in. And, you know, I think that kind of just spoke volumes to them to like how, you know, I was willing to come through no matter what the situation was to make it to that meeting. So I think kind of just them seeing that also kind of gave us a step up in that meeting. But also, you know, one thing I've always kind of had to deal, deal with when I started to say this was my age. Um, just, you know, quite frankly, not a lot of people take me serious. And it takes a lot for me to get them to take me serious. But usually once I'm talking about the accomplishments and the press and everything we've been able to do so far, you know, at that moment, they, they're like, oh, wait, this guy's a real deal. So, you know, that's one thing I oftentimes really have to deal with is just trying to get people to take me serious. Just because for some reason, think because you're younger, you don't know anything. I mean, I know everything, but I know a little bit of something. Uh, but even also just kind of going back to our Walmart order, we had a lot of things that uh, just went wrong in that process. Um, the war in Russia and Ukraine had broke out. And like I said, we get our products manufactured in China. Although China wasn't directly affected, you know, oil, oil was affected and the cost of everything just kind of just rose drastically. So initially we were getting uh, numbers from our factories and we we're like, okay, we can make this work. I can self-fund this with some um with what i have available and then slowly but surely the price started to rise and i wasn't able to get anything confirmed price and rise just because how uncertain everything was and it got to the point where my costs literally went up probably like around 40 to 50 percent and it was wow. to the point where i was like i don't have the money to pay for this order now um then i had a hard time trying to get loans or um backing from different banks just because once again my age i didn't have a lot of credit history or collateral, obviously. So it was hard getting uh, capital on that front. So I had to rely on family members and friends to get capital for that. And even when I was able to get the money to pay for everything, uh, it came literally down to the wire. Our goods had to be in Walmart stores by May 2nd. They didn't come into me until like April 22nd, I don't think. So we wow. literally had to hunker down and package over 15,000 boxes and package them in displays and put them in boxes and get them labeled all within the course of like five or six days. I think we had until the truck came uh, to pick up the products. So it really was an all hands on effort. And that's why at the end of the day, as entrepreneurs, you know, I, I, I do not like listening to like different like YouTube videos and they say, oh, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and I did all this by myself because that really never happens at the end of the day everybody has to rely on someone. So just make sure you have someone in your corner to help support you while you go through this. Wow, I mean, that is just amazing. Again, hats off on such a great accomplishment and especially going through all that and still getting your orders there on time and such a short turnaround. Um, you know, if you, 
you know, during this whole time, you've acquired even more skill sets and more tools, mm -hmm. right? So what do you think are some of the, besides the time management, mm -hmm. what's the most important thing you think that you've acquired through the learning process? Yeah, I think one thing is definitely like being willing to like change directions at like a moment's notice. Because if you're not willing to do that, you can very easily burn out or just simply fail at the task at hand. So just being capable and willing to be able to make the changes that are necessary to help get you to that next step. Nice. Being flexible. Yeah. Very good. Like, I, I, I totally understand that. Uh, I, I always explain that to my wife. You just got to be flexible a little bit with the kids, right? Um, all right, so Kate, I have a question for you because where can everyday inventors find their Kate? Yeah, um, so first thing I want to mention uh, is Deepak, you may pay for that comment. <laughs> but to your wife, just full disclosure as a recording, you're, the, these recordings last forever, you know, uh, in perpetuity. For, um, they're they evergreen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I, I mean, in all seriousness, um, I hate to be this vague, but you, you can really look everywhere, you know, sometimes it's in a formal relationship, like in a classroom, sometimes it's through a founder program, sometimes it's through someone you see at a conference and you're like, wow, those words really inspire me. Um, and you LinkedIn cold message them, you know, for six months until they pay attention to you. But sometimes it's someone you bump into a, uh, at a coffee shop and you just start talking about your idea and they're like, hey, um, I, I have this resource that can help. And that becomes a, a mentor relationship. So, you know, finding a mentor is really a combination of uh, the hustle to grow your network, the courage to make asks of people you don't know, um, luck on your part and timing on your mentor's part. And sometimes all of those things come together and that's where the, the real magic happens, you know? Um, and to David's point, um, you know, you can't do this alone. Um, I am not David's sole mentor and I'm so glad I'm not, you know, um, it, it really does, you know, take a village, take a network, um, take family, take all of those things, um, a, a series of villages, if you would. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, always be on the lookout for a mentor, but a lot of times it's also just the gut feeling, um, somebody who's willing to work with you, uh, without expecting anything back in return. Um, and sometimes that's why education is, is one of the best uh, places to find it, but, you know, it, it, uh, it doesn't have to be education. Um, education can happen anywhere in any relationship. Um, so just be on the lookout for it. Wow, that's great advice. Um, hey, we're going to stick, stick with you. So since you've worked with startups, what are the top three pieces of advice you'd like to share to those in the audience who are just starting their businesses? Sure. Um, so my top three pieces of advice, one, Definitely your idea should solve a problem. Uh, don't create a solution looking for a problem. Um, you know, the, uh, the more invested you are in your own solution, um, chances are, you know, uh, the deeper in you get, you'll find other people who also have the same problem. Um, but don't create a solution because you think you can sell it quickly or, or get rich quick. Um, really try to solve a problem. Um, the second thing, and this is, again, as I mentioned, something that investors look out for more and more in early stage businesses is it's that founder market fit. So it's when you solve a problem that you've experienced and so have a lot of other people. Um, it's that drive, and David, I'm sure you can speak to this even better than I can, but it's that drive that gets you through the boring, the mundane, the slog days uh, of being an entrepreneur, the days when you have flows and the problems just keep coming. Um, you know, and those are the days that you don't hear about in Forbes or Inc or uh, Entrepreneur Magazine. Um, so that's my second piece of advice is solve a problem that you have experience with. The third piece of advice is, again, something that David absolutely embodies and something that I saw very, very early on when he showed up for those monthly meetings. Um, it's you always do what you say you're going to do. Um, you know, a, a, another uh, wise uh, being called Yoda also said this. He said, you know, do or do not, there is no try. 
Um, so if you're an early stage founder, I would say start talking to other people about your big audacious ideas and then always do what you say you're going to do. That's how you build solid working relationships. That's how you build reputation when you're just starting out. That's how you overcome uh, perception barriers such as age um, or other things. So always do what you say you're going to do. And Kate, you did a really great job with holding David accountable to oh, it, doing what he's supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it was a lot harder when I couldn't when I didn't have control over his grades. But uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, David. Now, based upon your journey, uh, obtaining a patent or patent pending, uh, getting your trademark, you know, are there any nuggets of information you want to share or mm -hmm. anything you wish you knew before you started this entire process yeah um definitely one big thing is get a good attorney do your research <laughs> find yourself a great attorney who who believes in your product believes in yourself otherwise it's just going to be very expensive a very expensive process so just making sure you get yourself a great attorney to help you <laughs> on that entire journey <laughs> okay for all the startups out there, what's the one thing that they should do before they start any journey? With intellectual um, property, let me preface that. Before they start looking into intellectual property, what should they what should they know? So uh into as a value add uh to everything that we've covered in this conversation. Um I would say everything that we've covered and um, one of the biggest um, pain points that I see in entrepreneurs is that they are a year and a half in and they're going uh, to an investor or they are trying to figure out if they should, um, you know, uh, pivot or persevere um, or, or let go of that idea and they have no data. Well, the data lies in your finances, right? And I'm not, I did not start out as a finance person, um, but as a founder you have to know you know your balance sheet your income statement your profit and loss uh and your cash flow statement you know you have to get those numbers down you have to get down, release you know all the metrics but uh your numbers around your money uh, so yeah that's good David, and, I'm looking at you we... <laughs> <laughs> And you, you must have obviously known your numbers when you talk to Walmart and other companies because they, they, they like the numbers that you had and they're ordering from you, which is awesome. Uh, you know, what do they say on like Shark Tank? Like, was it Mr. Wonderful? Show us the numbers, right? And that's what it comes down to is like, are you managing it? Do you know what's going on? That's, a, that's great advice. Um, okay, David, question for you. If you had one word that summed up your entire entrepreneur and inventor journey, what would it be? Oh man. Um, I would say resilient. The only reason why is because we had a lot of walls and hurdles we had to jump over and somehow we always landed feet first. I do not know how just kind of looking back. So I would just say, just being resilient. That would be the word I would use to sum up that entire journey. Oh, wow, very good. Uh, I think there's one more question I wanted to ask, and it's going to be to both of you. Who was more persistent in meeting and keeping things on track? Was it David or Kate? Who was the David. one who's like, no, do this? <laughs> David, David. Uh, because he showed up. Honestly, you know, um, as a as a faculty member, and all professors can speak to this. You hold your office hours, and you schedule a meeting with your student, and you have no idea really if they're going to show up, right? Um, but entrepreneurship, um, as David embodies and knows, and is a is a stellar example of of is that you do you show up. Um, you take action uh, after each journal, um, but it, it it comes down to 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 showing up, um, and that's what he did. 
fantastic. Um, I wanted to thank both of you for joining and sharing uh, this mentorship and the success that you guys have had describing the different characteristics and the whole process. It was an honor to have you here. Uh, I loved our conversations prior to this and during this conversation. Thank you so much uh, for participating in today's program. And David, okay, I wish you the best of luck going in your future endeavors. Well, thank, thank you, you so much, much for having us. Yeah, so, thanks for hosting. It, it's been a pleasure. It's easy talking to you too. <laughs> All right, with that, I'm gonna ask our distinguished guests to please turn off their cameras. And I will be going over uh, a few resources that the PTO has to offer for inventors and entrepreneurs. But first, like I promise, please get out your cell phones and prepare to scan the QR code. Again, this is the survey to get feedback that we will use to help make our programs better, our future programs better. Um, I'm going to leave this up there for about 10 or 15 seconds, and then we will move on. And if you don't have uh, your phone ready, the link after this program concludes, you will also receive a link uh, to be able to take the survey directly. All right. Now we're going to discuss some resources for independent inventors, small business owners, and entrepreneurs. The first thing I want to say is if you enjoyed today's program, we have programming year round. Uh, they're all free. You can click on this QR code. Um, the quick link to it is www.uspto.gov slash innovation for all. We have programs that go up year round. Please join us. Uh, we'd love to have you. We have some very uh, interesting conversations and special guests at each of these programs. So we'd love to have you. Please feel free to join us. The next webpage is uh, our resources for inventors and entrepreneurs. And if you can see, it's structured in a way where it kind of guides you along your journey. You'll start off with what you need to get started. What are the different types of IP? Uh, what do you need? Uh, and then before you apply, you know, again, you get to search for patents, look for any trademarks that might be out there, things that you know, you want to check to see what's in the market, what is already, you know, been published or patented. And then you get help to apply, right? This is where you find resources in your area, pro bono help, uh, PTRCs. Within this subsection, you'll see a link for free services. That is one of the newer uh, USPTO web pages that have been created where it breaks down basically all the different places that we offer free services for, including links to entrepreneur and um, startup resources. So please check out this. Again, the QR code is there, or the a short URL is www.uspto.gov forward slash inventors. If you want to find help in your area, again, this is a QR code. We also have five different outreach offices across the U.S. that are uh, that can help locally with questions. Uh, these are their different regions. But if you go to the www.uspto.gov forward slash locations, you'll be able to actually click on the state that you reside in, and you'll get a list of the pro bono help, the law school certification clinics. Uh, places where you can go to help, uh, patent trademark resource centers, which are local librarians 
who have been trained in uh, intellectual property who can help you guide you uh, through the application process or any questions that you may have. Uh, this is the legal assistance program. Again, this is also found on the locations page, but if you want to go directly to the free legal assistance page, you can scan on the QR code. And of course, you can always stay connected with us. You can find out more information and news alerts, upcoming events uh, regarding all sorts of intellectual property by subscribing uh, on our subscription page. Of course, we have the QR code. And then, of course, we have www.uspto.gov forward slash subscribe. With that, I wanted to conclude today's program. It's been fun being your host and uh, moderator for today's program. Uh, if you uh, feel like leaving some feedback, please remember to fill out the survey. And uh, we will conclude the program. I hope you have a great day.